From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. It's a lucky break in life to meet and get to know people whose personal histories are both remarkable and inspiring. A couple of years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of meeting and becoming friends with today's Blue Sky guest, John Daniel. And he's precisely this kind of person. Equally, and perhaps even more impressive, is his wife, Leslie. But more on her later. As you'll soon learn, John survived a tough childhood to become a successful executive leading the human resources function at several major banks in the Southeast. But in adulthood, the hardships kept coming, first in the form of his wife's terminal illness, and then his own battle with a cardiac condition that resulted in his receiving a heart transplant. But with John, setbacks seemed to inspire him to do more. Following his retirement from banking and with his new transplanted heart, No one would have blamed him from hitting the golf course or fishing hole, but he's just not wired that way. And after completing the Advanced Leadership Initiative at Harvard University, John and Leslie Daniel founded Bluff City Pickleball, a community recreation center designed to bring together people from all walks of life in their hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, the largest black majority city in America. I hope that through this Blue Sky conversation, You enjoy getting to know John Daniel as much as I have. John Daniel, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. All right. It's so exciting to be here, Bill. Thank you for the invite. It's a pleasure to have you. I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years, and I have come to find that you have led a remarkable and eventful life, and it's hard with someone like you to know where to start. So I'm going to start at the easy way and start with your childhood. You did not have it easy and you have reflected on your life to conclude that a lot of that lack of ease growing up is part of who you are and, and explains a lot of your grit and resilience. So can you talk about what your childhood was like and how you were raised? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, I had what I realized now was a challenging childhood and but it fit neatly in the uh, era of the grown up in the 50s and 60s, you know, with, yep. uh, you know, the, the working class neighborhood that I was in. Um, there weren't there wasn't a lot of affluence. But, you know, my uh, my mother uh, and dad had, uh, you know, 10 pregnancies and nine children in like mm. 16 years. Mm. And, um, you know, I never remember my mother other than her being pregnant. Most of the time. That I was, <laughs> right. Uh, and so, you know. Uh, there was one time that she went to the hospital and co- didn't come back with a baby, you know, and it was like, okay, uh, nobody talked about it forever. But uh, the, uh, so we had a, a, we were, you know, in a working class neighborhood, Yeah. nine children. My father uh, struggled with alcoholism most of his life. And in the early years, he had trouble finding work. So, mm. you know, we were often the beneficiaries of, you know, um, schools and churches delivering baskets for Christmas or providing food. And, you know, it, it was just accepted as normal because there were other people in the community that had similar challenges. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, dad eventually got a job as a police officer, which means he had a steady paycheck. And I think he loved being a police officer and he, hmm. he really tried to fight his alcoholism, but it just, just, it just affected his whole life and it affected all of his children in significant ways. And so that's the defining, the de- defining thing was a large family which yep. was a real plus because I had love. I had a strong mother. Um, I had a sense of community. Uh, but uh, looking back, you know, the challenges of alcoholism and the emotional, uh, you know, baggage that comes with that stays with you forever. And you mentioned it affected all of your siblings, of, of which there were many, one of nine. Um, and that uh, alcoholism very directly, some of them struggled with it. And, and from my knowledge, you you have managed not to. Why Why do you think that is? Is it because clearly alcoholism is genetic, but it didn't seem to impact all nine kids equally. You, was there something about you? Did you make a conscious effort 
to avoid yeah, that I path? Mean, I, I've thought about that, Bill, a lot, you know, uh, and reflected on it. Of course, uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on this on this whole subject because of my fascination with it. And it's clear that genetic influences are very strong. Sure. The other, the other part of it is, you know, part of our personality traits are highly heritable. And, uh, you know, I can see a direct line between my mother, you know, who, who ran away from an abusive father at the age of 17 to secretly marry my father against mm. his wishes. She, she was basically disowned by her father and never spoke to him again in her, in her, in her entire life. Wow. And, you know, she was strong. Uh, yeah. You know, 17 years old, she started having babies right away. And she went on after a very, very difficult life to be a very successful, well-known community and civil rights activist. Incredible. Um, that, uh, you know, and so it's clear to me uh, that I had the same kind of genetic makeup. But I also had the other thing, the environmental thing, which was that she was a strong woman hmm. who provided a lot of love. And I was her oldest son. And I think, you know, I got special attention and treatment. And I was wow. treated as an adult. So I was very mature you know, at a very young age, because she just took me under her wing. She could see the intellectual curiosity I had. And so I think it was, it's both, I have a genetic predisposition for certain positive traits. And I had a strong influence from a mother who I probably got a lot of her genes. And, and in your TED talk, which I recommend to everyone listening, everything's going to be all right. You you talk about Malcolm Gladwell in his book, I think it's David and Goliath, where he, he talked about the advantages of disadvantages. So can you just briefly talk about that? Because a lot of us are faced with challenges and we think it's going to be the end of us. But he's able to point out, and you have, you've agreed with him, that there are some advantages to these things. Can you try to describe that to us? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a growing body of research that shows that, in fact, uh, you know, you see it recently with the work that John Haidt and Gene Twenge are doing yes. around you know, the generations that are being influenced by social social yes. media and the dangers that's providing. But, you know, you, children today don't, for example, have free play. So they don't, they don't, there's no ability to resolve conflict and deal with adversity. So they don't develop the skill set. And, you know, I was blessed in a sense to have very difficult challenges and yeah. was forced to respond to them. And, yeah. you know, uh, I think it's Nietzsche, what, uh, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. I think even uh, was it Taylor Swift that made a song out of it. <laughs> yeah. and many think that she was the author of the quote, but <laughs> it goes back to one of great philosopher. But it's it's so true. And as I reflect back on my life, and I thought about all the difficult challenges I had, I realized as I went through life that they they benefit me. I'll give you a specific example. My father could be you know he's an interesting character. He could be hmm. a storyteller. I mean, he, he, he could be a loving person, but he also was emotionally abusive and he could be mm. really tough. He was a cop, right? So he was really yeah, tough. Yeah. When I started working at the bank in the 70s, there were some old school managers there, you know, the old World War II hierarchy yes. demanding, you know, none of the love and affection that you see from leaders today. Sure. And they were a piece of cake next to my old man. So you know, <laughs> right. I, I yep. flourished because I would not <laughs> allow those leaders to intimidate me. And I think I got respect because of it. And so it's just one example of when you have experienced adversity and toughness early on, you know, it just it it, it also just builds your internal grit as, uh, you know, as Angela Duckworth talks about in her great book, Grit, which also captures the same the same thoughts. Yeah. Jonathan Haidt in his new book, I think it is. He I heard this. I won't get it exactly right. But he said, you know, sometimes. We treat kids like they're fragile glass and they'll break. But really, I think he used the, it's more like steel and, the, and they get stronger. Yes. And he, one of the strange statistics he put out, I did a double take, but I, I got it eventually. The rate of broken bones in little kids, not, obviously not from abuse and such, but, but from you know, going out in the playground and falling off the swing is, is down like 50% in the last whatever period. He, just, he has these really interesting statistics where you're like, yeah, actually, that's right. That's not necessarily such a great thing. So it's fascinating stuff. So you talked about going to the bank in the 70s with these with these tough managers. Let's talk about your career in banking. Why banking? And then really most of your career, I believe, and certainly your the most successful years were in human resources, which is an interesting thing given what you just described about your upbringing. Can you talk about all that? 
Yeah, well, you know, it's. Uh, I wish I could tell you that, uh, you know, that I sat down and had, you know, that I wanted to work at a bank. But <laughs> little, this is a true yeah. story. Like I met this beautiful girl uh, at the at the Kraft and Ingram car wash that I was working at when I was in high school, <laughs> and you know, yeah. she was the daughter of a you know a professional guy who was a manager at a major railroad in town, and here I am, you know, dating her his daughter, and he could see it was getting serious, and I'm working at the car wash. So he basically calls his neighbor and said, you know, my daughter's falling for this kid who works at the car wash. Can you get him a job at the bank? It's a true. And so literally my father-in-law, who would eventually become my father-in-law, called me up and said, go over and see Mr. Phillips. He wants to talk to you about a job at the bank. My first job at the bank was as a messenger on the loading dock in the evening shift while I went to university during the day. And, uh, you know, 25 years later, I was a senior vice president, you know, and I had no, you know, no bank training, no finance training. But it was just I my ability to respond to adversity, mm. to stick to this and the work ethic that I think I got from my mom just, just yeah. really, you know, came through. We can only imagine what life was like in the Daniels home, especially for his mom. Ten pregnancies and nine children in 16 years with a husband battling alcoholism and struggling to find and keep work. But she was a rock for John, and all these years later, he still credits her for much of his survival and success. And John offers a helpful reminder for all of us when we face challenges, that sometimes there are advantages to disadvantages, and persevering through difficulties really can make us stronger. Now, in the interest of remaining as factual as we can here on Blue Sky, I do need to correct John on one thing. The song Stronger that he references was not by Taylor Swift. It's easy today to assume that most hits are from her, but to give credit where it's due, this one was recorded by former American Idol and current talk show host Kelly Clarkson. And if this song is your earworm for the rest of the day, that's on John, not me. Now. Getting back to our conversation, I asked John why he was attracted to the field of human resources. Well, you know, I ended up, uh, this is uh, interesting in one sense. I I was a very, uh, I wouldn't say I was extremely introverted, but I was a little bit shy. uh, And uh, one of the bank managers saw my potential Hmm. and he said, you you know, you need to be more assertive. And I'm going to send you to the Dale Carnegie course on effective speaking and human relations, which I took when I was like. 22 years old. <laughs> and I was the youngest person in the class. And I loved it. Yeah. And I realized that I had a good storytelling ability and that yeah. I was actually really good at speaking in public. Yeah. And so here I am working in the branch of branch bank. You know, I'd moved up from the uh, loading dock to a check processor to loan off the loan collector. And I got a job working in a branch as an assistant manager. And they said to me, Daniel, you know, we need somebody to train people in customer service. Can you do that? Because they knew I could speak. And so I did. And I loved it. And I got drafted into human resources and found out, oh, my God, this is my life's work. I really, really, I loved my career. It was just a perfect fit. Amazing. And that, so like you said, that that girl that you were interested in, whose father got you a job, wind up being your wife. She did, Yes. And you were married for how many years? Uh, We were together for uh, almost 40 years. Uh, You know, she, uh, uh, we had three sons and uh, in her 50s, she contracted cancer. And after multiple bouts of cancer, she died at the age of 57. And what year was that, John? Uh, She died in 2011. It was, uh, it was another, it was a long and brutal battle at the end. And, uh, you know, it took a toll on my sons and me, uh, but, you know, we had a really, you know, great life together. And so, you know, it was a blessing. Uh, and but I think it was also the grit and determination that I had, tra- you know, had that became a part of who I was that got me through that. So we've talked about your upbringing. You have just had this successful career, wonderful marriage, three sons. Then this happens with your wife. Yeah. Somewhere in here, you are diagnosed with a with a heart ailment. When when in your life did you first know that you were ha- going to have issues with your heart? Yeah, when I was in my thirties, I uh, I was uh, in a car accident, minor car accident, but I had to go to the emergency room, and they uh, they picked up something in my heart uh, uh, 
uh, and it, it turned out that I had had a viral infection and, uh, they said, you know, you, you, uh, you have a, a valve problem and you need to pay attention to it. But I got a virus again in my early 40s and it completely damaged my heart. Um, so, you know, ejection fraction is a measure of a heart's comp- pumping capability. And for most adults, healthy adults, it's 55 to 60. Mine was 40 for most of my, from the time I was about 40 years old. And the doctors told me that, you know, you, you can live a normal life, take care of yourself and do all the right things. But, you know, someday your heart's just going to wear out and you're going to mm. you're going to have to have a transplant. There's no cure for this. A viral infection damages your heart muscle. There's just no cure other than transplantation. And, Bill, I remember this. I was whatever I was in the early 40s. My career was at a peak. My kids were healthy. And I remember saying a prayer like, you know, if they could just get me to 60, you know, my kids will be grown. My career will be in shape. Yeah. Literally at age 59 and a half, my heart failed. <laughs> It was, you know, like you beat prayer works. <laughs> so, so just years after your wife passed. Yeah. That, so you, you've, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're barely coming out of that and you never come out of something like that completely, but you're barely sort of pulling out of that. And then you're faced with this. And this is where John, you know, knowing you as I do and having seen your Ted talk where I, I just think your story becomes particularly astounding. And so how do you get your head around this idea that, this beyond vital organ in your body is going to fail and you are going to need to have it removed from your body and replaced by somebody else. How do you get your head and heart, your heart and everything around that? It's, it's really a fascinating because sometimes when I go to the hospital and I relive, you know, I have to go to the hospital every quarter for checkup. And uh, when I walk through the halls, I have the kind of emotion that comes immediately to remembering what it was like, but it's a very surreal kind of experience uh, to know that, you know, they're going to take the heart out you were born with and then put another one in and it's going to work out. All right. You know, and it, it just thinking about it all, it like, it becomes a part of every moment of your life. And in my particular case, when my heart did fail, um, you know, they couldn't find a donor uh, and they have this uh, a device called a uh, um, left ventricular assist device, better known as an LVAD. And LVAD is actually a pump they install in your heart. Uh, they sew it into your heart. And you have a line uh, that comes from the pump through your stomach, which is attached to a battery and a computer that manages the pump. And I remember them telling me, you know, if, if we don't find a donor for you, you're not going to make it. So we've got to put this LVAD in. And I'm sitting there in the hospital thinking, I mean, i got to walk around with a machine that's attached to me. And yet yeah. whatever it is that that's, that is inside of me, this determination that, you know, whatever it is that I face, I'm going to find a way to get through it. Just showed up again. And so I had in a period of a little less than a year, two open heart surgeries, uh, because, you know, 11 months later, uh, they did find what many doctors would describe as a perfect, perfect donor. Uh, you know, there's obviously human tragedy on the other side of that. So I always speak respectfully of that. But uh, mm. I was blessed to get, uh, you know, the, the heart of a 20 year old who died in a motorcycle accident, who had no history of illness or drug use or anything. I mean, it was like, if you were going to design a package, this is the one you'd want. And so uh, I recovered very, very quickly. And it's been almost 10 years and my heart um, it works fabulously. Back to when you had that machine, you sort of mentioned in passing that there's a battery. If I'm recalling correctly, were you not at a theatrical production one time? Can you <laughs> and something happened. Can you tell that story? Yeah, that's, that's, there's so many moments like that. But, you know, literally, <laughs> uh, you have two batteries. And they, uh, at the time, there, the technology's changed a little bit in the last 10 years. But at the time I was wearing the LVAD, there were two batteries about the size of a, the old VHS tips, which would not even be a, an example for many people to understand yeah. what it was. But it was a pretty big battery. And what you would do is you would charge those for 12 hours, and then you'd switch them out. And in the evening, you would plug into an outlet to keep the pump going. So you always had to have charge. And I remember we were, we, we lived our full life. When I had the LVAD, I went to Disney world. I went back to work <laughs> less than two months after the surgery, part-time initially, but I went back to work, but I also lived my life. And so we had tickets to the Lion King one night and in a rush to get dressed, I put in the used batteries, not the uh. charged batteries. And literally in the, you know, about, 20 minutes into the Lion King presentation, uh, if the battery's low, the device gives off a beeping sound. 
And all of a sudden it started beeping. And Leslie looked over at me and she goes, with this ghastly look on her face, did you forget to change the batteries? Oh. And I said, I looked down and I see the charge was really no. Now the computer that's attached to it has a little charge too. So there's a little safety mechanism there. But I literally got up, raced outside, saw a police officer and told him, you know, like I got like I got to get home really quick. And he helped me get my car out of the parking spot. I raced home. Luckily, we lived downtown, so it was only about a 10, 12 minute drive. Raced up to the bedroom, switched out the batteries, went back. And at halftime, entered just about, at the, what do you call it, <laughs> halftime, the intermission? Intermission. I was able to watch the rest of the lunch. <laughs> it was a scary moment, but true story. For those of us who get nervous when our cell phone is down to 5%, and and and, and this image of, you know, they're singing Hakuna Matata yep. while you're, <laughs> <laughs> and no worries. I mean, I can't even get my head around that story. But but that's that's what you were living with. And so, and you mentioned Leslie. So Leslie, then girlfriend, were you married at the time? You're now married to the wonderful woman who I've come to know, Leslie. Was were you? Was she your girlfriend then, or? Yeah, I said uh, we had uh, we had we had just gotten married, um, and so Leslie's uh, you know honeymoon was you know literally we got married in June of 2014, and my heart failed in September. So the Albad was installed in November of that year. So her her honeymoon was taking care of uh, of me, but uh, you know she. She, uh, like, I, I like to say to people, I was blessed with two loves. I mean, two amazing women. Leslie and I had known each other uh, in, during the time that I was going through uh, the, the crisis with my wife. And she just has this beautiful smile and this positive way about her that really appealed to me. And so, uh, you know, and that brought us together. And uh, you know, she, she just was a fabulous person through all this. You know, to 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 stick with somebody that you know to go through two open heart surgeries. <laughs> it's sometimes said that none of us can truly be described as self-made. John Daniel credits his mom for keeping him on the straight and narrow. And growing up and early in his career, he describes being shy and introverted. But he was fortunate to have a manager and mentor who saw his potential. He sent John to Dale Carnegie, and that changed the trajectory of his life. But while John thrived at work, he faced more personal challenges. In his 30s, he was found to have a heart condition and was told several years later that he'd likely need a transplant eventually. Years after that, his wife got cancer and died in 2011 at the age of 57. John describes the grit required to get him and his sons through this difficult time of loss and grief, only to find out soon after, just shy of his 60th birthday, that he would soon need his heart transplant and in preparation would have to undergo major surgery to be hooked up to a battery activated device that would keep him alive. And while it's easy to laugh now, can you imagine being John or his new wife, Leslie, settling in for a day at the theater only to have his life-saving device run low on battery? And think of John rushing out and trying to explain this all to a police officer? Incredible. Eventually, he was fortunate to be the recipient of a young person's heart. And getting back to our conversation, I wanted to talk more with John about the actual transplant procedure. I just want to dwell a little bit more on the actual transplant and that what goes through your mind and you know i i get a little nervous going to the dentist right <laughs> you're going in to have this procedure um i know i know you took very good care of your body and tried to stay in shape going into you did everything that was in your control uh, but then so much ultimately is out of your control and you're literally being wheeled into this room and can you tell the story about i think it was a nurse who may have put her hand on you and and told you it was going to be all right yeah it was very interesting because uh, I wouldn't consider my search, uh, you know, person a really deep faith like Leslie's faith is just just unshakable. I, I just remember the when you when you're on the way to the operating room, you know, it's, you're finally going to face that moment where they're going to put you asleep, and you really don't know whether you're going to wake up. Like during the time that I was, I met with and socialized through social media and other places, a lot of people that were going through transplants or. Had, waiting for a heart or whatever, because you make those connections to keep your mental health strong. 
And, you know, several people die. And so, you know, when you're on the way, you're finally on the way to the operating room, you have these moments, a 10 minute, uh, 10 minute trip to the operating room seems like a lifetime as you think about all the things that are, you know, am I going to wake up, you know, and uh, I think I talked about this in the TED talk. I mean, you ask the big questions about your life. You know, was I a good person? Was I a good dad? Was I a good brother? And I just, you know, we want to leave a legacy and, uh, you, you come to grips with the face uh, with your mortality. But uh, when I was wheeled into the operating room, uh, you know, as, as an HR guy, so I'm always thinking about process and how does this work? And I think about teamwork and I got all these people dressed in blues and greens and there's all this technology and TV cameras and, you know, it's cold and it's antiseptic. And I used the you know example that it seemed like, um, a special forces operation, getting ready for a mission. Because here I am, the patient, wheeled in to this space, and all these people are doing all this prep work, and nobody's paying attention to me. So I was both fascinated, but also felt alone, like terribly alone. And finally, you know, a woman, a nurse, came up to me and and put her hand on my chest and said, Mr. Daniel, everything is going to be all right. And obviously that was the inspiration for my TED Talk. Uh, which was there was just a moment of calm that came over me because literally a few seconds later, I could feel the cold, you know, fluid entering my veins and I was out. I didn't wake up for a few days, you know, with a new heart and a machine no longer attached to me. Wow. Okay. So, um, and then obviously there's serious recovery. That's a very, very traumatizing surgery. So how, how do you get through the recovery and then how do you, how do you get back to your normal life? Yeah, the, the LVAD surgery was actually really brutal. Um, and that was much, much harder than a transplant. I mean, the transplant wasn't easy, but uh, during the uh, recovery from the LVAD, I had an infection, which is very common for major surgery. I had some internal bleeding, so I had to have transfusions. And, uh, you know, I, despite all the determination and, you know, the things we've talked about, you know, my, you know, there was a period where you're filled with drugs because of the pain. You're going through this. I just really is at a low, low point. And I remember telling Leslie, you know, who was hanging in there, like, I, I'm not sure I can, you know, I want to do this anymore. And, you know, Leslie had a grandmother that she loved more than anything in the whole world. And she used to talk about it all the time. And I never had a chance to meet her. Uh, she died before Leslie and I actually became a couple. And uh, um, I just remember saying to her, I think I'm ready to go finally meet your grandmother. And she just said, no, <laughs> you know, no. And, you know, just having that person pull you up from that lowest moment, um, you got to stay here for me. Like, you, and so, you know, I got through those couple of days, but it is, uh, the LVAD surgery is really painful. I mean, you have 55 staples in your chest when you recover. Uh, The first day, I mean, they want you up. So, you know, maybe a day or two later, you're standing. I remember taking a walk to the edge of the door and thinking, I can't do this. I remember the next day I took a walk a little bit further than the door to, you know, by the end of the week, I was walking around the hallways. Um, and it's just, you know, the, you just have to have this like amazing determination that I'm going to take these every step and I'm going to do this. And Oh, by the way, when I, after the LVAT surgery, I knew I'd have to do it again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it, it right. Twice. Yeah. So if you're, if you're you, lucky, you know, <laughs> it, it, yeah, exactly. Wow. And, but I, you know, the secret you know, I, that I say this all the time when I give talks about, it, you know, you have to have a vision of your life at the end. Like I could see myself going back to work. You know, work was important to me. You know, I was old enough, had been, a, you know, had been successful. I could have retired. But the secret and I love my job. I had this amazing guy for a boss. I had great peers that I admired and respected and I loved the company. So. You know, I just was determined I was going to go back to work. And luckily I had a boss that said, you know, I remember telling him I got to go through two surgeries. You know, you're going to be without a HR executive. He just said, we'll wait for you. You know, we'll we'll handle it. And and my team rallied around me and so forth. So, you know, it all worked out great. But to me, having that goal at the end that I'm going to go back and I'm going to be a leader again, I'm going to be there for my team, I'm going to be there for my company, was the thing that keeps you going. Like, And so you like there's a rush to get there. The other story I told in the TED Talk, which is so true, when I was sitting there in the bed, you know, trying to keep my muscle strength and whatever, uh, I, I envisioned that I had this vision that I would go on a bike ride in, uh, in, in Colorado, like to do this 50 mile bike ride. And I said, I can't wait till I get healthy enough. 
to show people. And literally nine months after my transplant, Leslie and I took a trip to uh, Breckenridge, Colorado, and we did a 50 mile bike ride. And we have these beautiful pictures just because I said that I was going to do it. And it was a key to me getting through the, you know, the weeks of, of suffering and struggling. It's amazing. It's obviously it's a very different context, but it reminds me of, of Victor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning and, and the folks who survived in the, in the concentration camps were those, it's not the only reason they survived. They had other things that had to break their way, but it was, it was a hope and it was a purpose. And it was, this is what I'm going to do when I get out. Um, that kept them going. So it seemed like that was key to you as well. Uh, no, absolutely it is. And, you know, I was influenced by Frankel because I had read the book a couple of times early. So Interesting. And, uh, it, by the way, what an influential piece of work. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who either recommend it to me and I say I've already read it or who had an influence on their life. Incredible. So you went back to the bank. How many more years did you work at the bank before retiring? Yeah, I, uh, I had the transplant at 60 uh, and I, uh, it was probably by 61 by the time I got back to work. And I, I worked six more years until, you know, there was kind of a major merger and it was just a great, you know, great time for me to leave. Yep. And, uh, you know, I had groomed a successor who was a very capable woman that I was just so proud of. So it really Perfect. was, it was a good, it was a good time to leave. John Daniel mentions his TED Talk, and I'll put in a plug for it here. It's called Everything Will Be All Right, and it takes its title from what that nurse said to him as he was about to be put under for his life-saving procedure. In getting through any tough or scary time, that reminder that everything will be all right can of course be helpful. It's also important to have people supporting you, like that nurse or John's amazing wife, Leslie, and establishing a vision for a purpose or goal on the other side of your current hardship is invaluable. As was John's goal here of doing a 50 mile bike ride, which he did just a matter of months after his transplant. And so when you went in for that procedure, you mentioned thinking about, have I been a good person, good son, good father? Have I made a difference? And so, you and I met as fellow fellows at an advanced leadership initiative that's designed to help people like us think about what we want to do next. The result of my work is this, this conversation we're having in this Optimism Institute. What made you want to do that program? And, and what were you thinking you might do when you came out of it, when you started? And we'll get to what you've wound up doing. But what were you thinking as you entered that program? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was so much attracted to the idea that there was this program that you know, for people like us that had had successful careers and most people retire in their 60s and they have, you know, there's, I guess the data says if you live till 60 and you have no significant health factor, you, you can live into your late 80s to early 90s. And uh, what are you going to do with the rest of that time? And, you know, it, it's probably, uh, you know, it's, 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 there's multiple motivations here. Like I have this deep need to, to, to be relevant and to have meaning and purpose in my life. And, uh, you know, I studied uh, a lot about and we and, and we did on a program about, you know, what is the secret to long life? And it, it is having meaning and purpose. And so I wanted to find an answer to the question, like, what else can I do with all the experience that I'd learned? And uh, I am involved in the community and I try to contribute that way. But I, I felt I needed something more tangible. Uh, and I was looking for the program to give me some ideas and insights to do that. Okay. And so you are speaking to me from Memphis, Tennessee, in uh, the site that is now Bluff City Pickleball. Yes. This is an idea I believe you hatched during the program. Maybe you had it going in. But let's, let's talk about what you are doing now. Why Pickleball? Why Bluff City Pickleball? And what are you hoping to accomplish? Yeah, well, actually, you know, I, is the summer uh, of the year we spend in our fellowship. In the summer, I, I play pickleball with my neighbors on the weekends. Yeah. And on uh, if you if you know anything about Memphis, Tennessee, the summers are brutally hot. You know, we're right on the Mississippi there. It's very humid. And it was a brutally hot day. And I was drenched in sweat. And uh, I was thinking about how much pickleball, how, how much fun we had. And I said, somebody's got to build up, you know, a pickleball club. Yeah, take an old building and put some pickleball courts in there with some air conditioning so we can play uh, <laughs> yeah. without this brutal heat. Strangely enough, 
About that time, I had read an article, and I think it was New York Magazine, magazine, the one something like, is can pickleball save America? <laughs> and most of the article was about the politics of na- the national pickleball. and But there was a seed in there about this idea that pickleball – has grown dramatically as a sport. You know, it's the fastest, grow, fastest growing participated sport in America. Uh, and it's grown because of its social nature, you know, particularly during the pandemic. It's a smaller court to tennis. You put, most of the game is played close to the net. It has a yeah. culture of, of social connection. And, uh, you know, boiling in my head was, what am I going to do with this fellowship? And, you know, working on boards is very important work, but it has no short term tangible you know, like it's it's important work, but, it, you know, the results of fighting a crime or, you know, generational poverty takes decades. So sure. what am I going to do with this? And I got this idea that I started researching about why don't I build a pickleball club, which will be, you know, like a social enterprise, uh, one that will get bring people together for social connection, get them active and healthy. Uh, all the things that we learn in our fellowship about what makes for a, a productive life uh, and a meaningful life and what makes for an extended life. And so I ended up cooking up this idea. I found an old movie theater that, uh, you know, in banking, we call that a single purpose facility. It's not a movie theater. It can't be anything else. And right. the owner was going to tear it down. And uh, he found out about pickleball and we made a connection. So I converted an old movie theater theater into a pickleball club, which just opened this month. Uh, actually, Incredible. I opened in the month of March of this year. And my understanding, John, too, part of the motivation was that, or part of the vision was that this place would be accessible to all kinds of people in Memphis, where you've got, like everywhere else, you got some big wealth inequalities, you've got racial challenges. So is that part of the vision as well? Yes, it is. You know, uh, as you know, less, less, my wife is African-American, and of course, we live in the largest majority black city in the United States, and uh, one that is, suffers with a history of segregation and uh, stru- you know, structural you know, problems of the challenge you know, that face the whole population here. So um, it, we just saw that Memphis was a great place to, that needed to bring people together, and that pickleball could be a way to do that. And so one of our visions is, is to bring older and younger people together, to bring black and white people together, and to use the sport, as sport has been for 100 years, as a way to connect people. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to realize that, that vision now. We, we also have a partnership with a, an organization, a nonprofit organization, that uses pickleball to teach economically disadvantaged children life skills, like emotional control and teamwork and kindness through sports. And so we're going to we're going to partner with them and see if we can, you know, use pickleball as a way to to make life better for people. It, it, it's it's such the perfect vehicle, too, because as a sport, I think one of the reasons it's grown so much, you mentioned it's social. Absolutely. It's also very accessible. So, you know, if you go try if you're 60 years old and you go try to learn to play golf, good luck. Right. <laughs> it's really hard. And you're never going to beat the guy who's been or the woman who's been playing for 40 years. Pickleball. People of all kinds of athletic skills and backgrounds can play together. And it's funny, I was talking to someone recently about uh, Robert Putnam's work and the book Bowling Alone. Yeah, one of my favorites. Incredible book, also extremely influential. Influential, yeah. And if people haven't read it, it's called Bowling Alone because he was doing research and he had been a bowler growing up, Robert Putnam. And he's talking to a guy who owns a bowling alley. He's like, he said, actually, bowling participation's up. But leagues are way down because people are actually bowling alone. And Putnam thought, I mean, half the fun of bowling is doing it with a group and having fun and laughing. And so as a, as a culture, he, he showed that we have become more isolated. We build back porches instead of front porches. And so there's a movement to try to bring those things back. And what you're doing with Bluff City Pickleball seems to me to be I mean, Robert Putnam would be very pleased with the work you're doing in Memphis. Yeah, I mean, Putnam was ahead of his time. I mean, that book was probably 20 years ago. It was. And it, I think it was 2001. Yep. And the trend lines have been, you know, they, they continued. The ones he identified, the, you know, the elimination of social clubs and, and you know, religious groups and whatever. Uh, so, but pickleball, interesting enough, is counter to that trend. You know, it, when I started look, doing research on it about when we were in our fellowship, the... Uh, you know, the numbers were three to five million to play people on it. The recent data from the sport 
the sporting goods industry said that, you know, there are 13 million core players and probably 30 to 35 million who have played pickleball. So it's, it's just incredible. booming. Uh, and the one data that can support that is the sale of, cl- you know, paddles and balls and nets are just through the roof. Incredible. And is Bluff City, is that the nickname for Memphis? Yeah, Memphis, uh, if, if anyone has ever visited Memphis, it's on right on the Mississippi River. Uh, and uh, in fact, we live on the Mississippi River. We overlook it on a bluff that, that looks over the city. So a nickname often used is Bluff City. And uh, we uh, we are in a we, we wanted to send a message that we're for everybody in the community. We, uh, we actually yeah. are on the border of the city. Uh, okay. We wanted to make sure that everybody knew that this was, this was for everyone in the city. And so uh, we just opened. We've had some really good uh, signs that, you know, people are, we had three major, all the, all the major uh, newspapers, which are mostly electronic now, but they have all done a story on us. Very positive because people are, uh, you know, I didn't tell this, uh, but, you know, right after Leslie and I got married, she got she, you know, got news that she had breast cancer, which was terribly shocking for us, for me, because <laughs> I had just lost <laughs> someone to cancer. And uh, she bounced back from that. Great. But, you know, we tell our story. But listen, we you know, we've been through a lot and, you know, yeah. we, we got to have some reason to keep contributing in a way, in a meaningful way to the world. And pickleball seemed like a fun thing to do. As John Daniel points out, people today can expect to live several years longer than did those of the generations before us. And it's helpful to think about what to expect and how to plan for those later years. For John, he describes having a deep need to be relevant. And in classic entrepreneurial fashion, he emerges from a sweaty game of outdoor pickleball in the Memphis summer heat with an idea for a community center. And similar to what Blue Sky alum Barrett Takesian built with his squash program in Maine, through pickleball, John is realizing his dream to bring people together in his hometown in Tennessee. And it's remarkable to see his vision in taking a movie theater that would likely have been torn down and converting it into a thriving new center of physical and social activity. Now back to the final segment of our Blue Sky Conversation with John Daniel. One of the things, and it's come out a little bit in this talk that I've observed about you, and it's been this interesting thread that runs through so many of the guests I've had on this show, is you are an avid reader, you're a lifelong learner, and you believe in a growth mindset. And to the point where now you actually have completed your own book uh, that, that is a result of so much of this deep diving and research that you've done. Can you talk about your book and and uh, how you came to write it? Well, you know, I, you know, as an HR executive, I went through, a, you know, in, in the banking industry, I went through a lot of consolidation and a lot of change. You know, the organization was, de- the banking was deregulated. So I saw a lot of change. And I worked for three major banking companies. And what was interesting, Bill, is that as, as people experience change, you know, I got the same reactions. Like, even though I was in three different companies, like, I, I knew there was going to be a Bill and a Mary, and I could predict certain behaviors. And I was intrigued by this idea that there are this stuff built into our nature, right? And it's it, if you understand human nature, you, you can be better at anticipating and predicting how people are going to respond to situations. Well, about that time, I read Steven Pinker's book, The Blank Slate. And I know you've had Steven uh, Pinker on you. On, and he's one of my favorite people in the world. I've read every one of his books. <laughs> Brilliant man. And, uh, you know, The Blank Slate, uh, the subtitle of The Blank Slate is called The Modern Denial of Human Nature. And he makes the case for the fact that, you know, we're not born with blank slates. You know, the, philo- the philosophers for generations talked about, you know, is, you know we, we're born with this blank slate and the environment shapes who we are, culture shapes who we are. Well, that's not true at all. And, uh, you know, Pinker in the book basically blasts away the notion that there's a blank slate when we're born. So the question I and, and he tackles this in his book. So what is the stuff that's born that's in there? Well, since then, there's been an explosion of research in the field of evolutionary psychology, which I have read probably 100 books on evolutionary psychology or neuroscience. And so as an HR practitioner, I saw all this stuff like what is the stuff that's built in and what implications does it have for those of us that lead people? So the title of my book is Ancestral Minds, 
leading, influencing, and collaborating with brains shaped on the savannah. <laughs> and in the book, I talk about the things that are built in. For example, we pay close attention to status. Status is very important to us, and that's a primate behavior, and it's wired into us. It shows up in some really interesting ways. Uh, our brain has a negative bias. Uh, a psychologist uh, named Roy Baumeister, book, Baumeister, a famous one, wrote a book called The Power of Bad, which documents the fact that our brain has a negative bias, and the way we interact with the world, that negative bias you know, affects us in significant ways. Daniel Kahneman, he sadly just passed away, talked a lot about this in his behavioral economics work. We also talk about the fact that the human brain needs certainty. I talk about how fairness is critical and how our brains are social in nation. I quote Robin Dunbar, the great evolutionary biologist, who talks about the fact that our brain is not primary, and Pinker tackles this really robustly in his last book, Rationality. But most people think that you know, our brains are primarily rational. They're problem solving, you know, that we're all Spock and we have a little of this emotion stuff in it. It's yeah. just the opposite. <laughs> we are primarily social. We, we don't, we think we have agency in most of the beliefs we have. Our, our beliefs come from the group around us. And, the, and then our brains create the rationale for what we believe, but that stuff's baked in. Hate talks about that when he talks about his, his moral intuitions. So I really talk, I, I quote from all the best, uh, thinkers in this space of what is the stuff that's in our brain. And then at the end of each chapter, I write, okay, if you're leading people, here's some things you should think about because the stuff's already there. And if you understood it, you'd be a better leader. And you're working with publishers now or is it, will the book be out? Any? Yeah. I uh, Do I, I have breaking it. news here on the Optimism Institute? You know, I, every, everything takes a little longer than you want it, but I, I actually am about to sign an agreement with a publisher after a couple of months of looking at the right publisher. So fantastic. You know, hopefully uh, uh, I understand it'll take, you know, seven, eight months to finish yeah. the editing process and so forth. So I'm really excited about it. You know, I don't know. I, I have no intent of making any money or, you know, I don't I'm not going to be a bestseller. But I just I had always said that I want to write a book. And there are a few HR executives that have the intellectual curiosity that combine those two for insights that I think there may be there's more than me. Right. But it, it's not a big bunch of people. And I thought it would be interesting. Well, and, and back to grit. Everyone would like to write a book and very few people do. It's much harder than it sounds. It's a lot of isolation and, and just grind it out. Um, it's interesting what you said about we're wired to be social too, because I've um, in the rational optimist um, that that is brought up quite a bit. That you know, it's and it's in transacting that we develop society, dealing with other people. I've read uh, I don't know if you've read Humankind by Rucker Bregman. I highly recommend I have, it. Yeah, one of my favorites. That we are we are actually cooperative as a species, and that's that's how we got to be so successful, if you want to call it that, as a species, and yet this negativity bias probably makes us think we're so divided and we all hate each other. <laughs> it's just, it's, I'm trying to break through that with the work I'm doing to try to help people understand that that's not our human nature necessarily. And, but it's work. Yeah. I mean, one person you should try to get in the show is Robert Sapolsky teaches at Stanford who he wrote a book called behave. And he's just, his, his recent release book is determined. So fascinating, but you know, he has a, he's a, you know, a primatologist first and then a neuroscientist, but, you know, really understands uh, 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 the deep roots of human behavior. And, you know, he has a realistic approach that, you know, our brain has these mechanisms. So both is true. We are both the characters portrayed in humankind, but there is a darkness to us. You know, uh, Sapolsky talks about oxytocin, which we know as the bonding, you know, neurotransmitter or hormone. You know, oxytocin in certain situations creates the us-them dynamic that makes them the enemy. So this brain is a fascinating thing if you understand it, that, you know, uh, which is why, you know, demagogues are dangerous creatures to have in a society because they they draw against the dark part of that that's in our nature. And uh, it's so important that you're doing the work you're doing because those forces uh, are, are very powerful. And, you know, they, you need to counteract that. And obviously you're a, a, a you know, a, you know, a, a fan of Pinker who's, a, who tries to do the same thing and, uh, uh, in a more academic way, but you, your work's important because we have to counter those trends that look at the dark side of us and, and, and actually utilize the dark side of our nature. Well, thanks. I, I, yeah, and the work you're doing is so important, and and this has been so fun for me to go back through this with you. Is uh, and and 
I've gotten to know you very well, and I'm glad that some of our listeners will get to know you at least a little bit, and hopefully uh, we'll look forward to your book. Back to where we started, John, as we wrap this up. There are people listening who either themselves or, or loved ones are going through a really tough, scary time. I can't think of anyone who's been through more toughness and scariness than you have. What message would you have for people listening to us today to help them get through all that? Yeah, you, I think you can't do it alone. I mean, you have to rely on the people that care about you. And uh, as I said in my TED Talk, the two things that I had because of the mother that I that I talked so much about at the beginning of our talk, uh, it's hope and love. Like you have to have people around you that care about you, that are cheering for you. Um, and you need to exit out in a careful way the people that uh, are taking energy away from you because – what I found when I was going through it is they're well-meaning people that say some of the darndest things. And you, you need cheerleaders. You know, our brain is highly sensitive to negative emotions. Um, you know, John Gottman, the great, about, uh, he's a the great psychologist who studies marriages, has something called the Gottman Ratio. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. So the ratio is that in marriages, he found that they were successful. They had a five to one positive ratio to positive comments to negative. And he studied marriages where people had a lot of negative energy in their conversation. And he was he could predict when a couple was going to get divorced based on their interaction. And this Gottman ratio has, has gotten very important to the idea that because of the negative bias on our brain, we have to surround ourselves with optimistic people who believe in us and keep our own hope alive. It's so critical because this brain will take you to a dark place unless you're surrounded by people who are painting a more positive, optimistic picture. On that note, John, <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end our conversation. I thank you so much for taking this time. I am so pleased to have you on the show. I know you're going to do great things with Bluff City Pickleball. I can't wait to order my T-shirt and uh, and visit in person sometime soon. But thank you so much, John, for being on the show. Hey, thanks, Bill. It's, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Did you notice how many different books John referenced and quoted from during our conversation? It's amazing how much he reads and studies. And he might be right that his book won't be a bestseller, but I know I'll be one of his buyers. And I'd like to underscore something John said here. We all need cheerleaders and life is too short to spend with people who take our energy away. And I appreciated his cheering me on in what we're trying to do here at the Optimism Institute to, as he says, beat back the pessimistic forces in our brain. Thank you, John. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky conversation with Bluff City Pickleball co-founder, John Daniel. Before you go, we'd appreciate you leaving us a rating or review. And if you haven't already, subscribing to Blue Sky on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. And while you're at it, check out the Optimism Institute on social media. And go to our website to sign up for our monthly newsletter, Blue Sky Weekend. My special thanks to the team at Sound On Studios for their incredible help with editing and mixing this and all of our Blue Sky episodes. You can learn more about their work at soundonstudios.com. And all graphic design and cover art for Blue Sky and the Optimism Institute are provided by Crush Graphics. And that's Crush with a K if you'd like to check out more of their fantastic work online. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke. And I thank you for listening.